So hello and good afternoon and I'm so happy to be here with you all today. My name is Suda and I'm here from Kula Kamala Foundation. We're just down the street from you and i um, so very grateful to Christopher and to Carrie for inviting me here to talk to you today. Uh, so let's just start with a little centering. So I'm going to ask everybody to sit up nice and tall in an easy seated posture. So legs can be crossed or straight forward and the spine tall and the hands resting down somewhere on the knees or the thighs and the eyes gently closed and then just begin to breathe meaningfully so that you are experiencing every part of every breath. As you breathe in, silently repeating to yourself, I know I am breathing in. And as you breathe out, I know I am breathing out. Allowing your breath to be calm, centering, allowing yourself to arrive in this moment. I'm taking a moment to set an intention in the midst of that stillness, in the midst of that peace. And perhaps the intention would be receptivity and openness to the potential, to the possibility. And as you exhale, draw the hands together in front of the heart. And together we'll chant one beautiful Om. Take a nice breath in. Om. And bowing your head towards your heart. Acknowledging the unity of all beings everywhere. And draw the face to center, flutter the eyes open. Namaste. Namaste. So nice to gather and to meet each and every one of you. I'm so happy to be here with you. So today we're going to talk a little bit, or a lot, about the lessons that yoga provides to us as householders living in a world that is somewhat busy, somewhat confusing, chaotic, and talk about how the variety of sacred texts that are associated with yoga support us in understanding how to make choices, how to control impulses, how to resolve conflicts. And so it's a very vast conversation. And sometimes there's confusion around terms or meanings. And try not to get caught there. Receive what you receive. Integrate it into your being in whatever way makes sense to you. And then like everything else in this life, over time, it will cultivate its own meaning for you and its own application. So there's nothing that I say here today that um, I'm trying to change your way of thinking or impose upon you a perspective. Everything today is a suggestion, a possibility of looking at potential, your potential, my potential, our potential, to walk through this life peacefully, compassionately, and in unity. And so with everything in yoga, we should always start with a chant to Ganesh. Is everybody familiar with who Ganesh is? Yeah? Wonderful. Very good. And so we'll do nine Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha. I'll do the first and then join in. And so again, just sitting tall. May the obstacles in this lifetime be purposeful. May the obstacles in this lifetime be meaningful to us on a knowable level. And may the obstacles that are not purposeful be resolved. 
Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha 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 And then opening the eyes, if they're not already. So you've each received a handout. Uh, today's program is called Practical Application of an Esoteric Science. And you'll see that's our beloved Ganesh right on the cover there. Mm -hmm. And so during this session, we're going to cover information about um, how yoga perceives we can behave, think, practice in order to fulfill uh, the dharma of being a good person, um, of living a good life, and of awakening to our true self. And as someone recently said, the ethic has to come first. Without the ethic, there is, um, there is really nothing else. And so many of the stories that we're going to talk about today, many of the sacred scriptures that we're going to talk about today focus on the ethic. And in yoga, we know that the ethics begin with which, which yama, which yama is first. Anybody remember? Ahimsa. So say ahimsa. 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 So sing. Ahimsa. 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 Not harming. Not violent, not violent, compassionate, compassionate in, all ways, in all ways, in everything. In everything. So ahimsa is the foundation. And it is the foundational ethic that a yogi should focus on. So We'll just kind of go through this a little bit and then we'll start to follow the sheet um, that I've given out to you. So when we look at yoga, we see that Patanjali is oftentimes called the father of yoga. Patanjali is an individual who lived potentially three to 5,000 years ago, sometime around the time that Buddha was alive. But nobody's really sure exactly when. And he wrote this amazing book called the Patanjali Yoga Sutras or the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And in there, he laid out 10 precepts, five yama, or restraints, or duties that we have walking through this world, and the niyama, five duties that we owe to ourselves. The yama comes first, the duties that we, we need to practice walking through this world. And the very first one is ahimsa, not harming. And so in yoga, everything that we do everything that we think, all actions that we take, could start with a consideration of, is it harmful? Is it harmful? Now, some things we do will be harmful beyond our control. When we breathe in and out through our nostrils, our nostrils create nitrous oxide, and it kills the little bacteria that are trying to get inside of our body. We can't help that. If that activity isn't present in our body, then we'll become infected with something and our life will be very short. But when we're walking down the street and we see hmm, a person we don't like or a dog breaking into our garbage can or any other thing that calls us to question our own compassion, we can stop ourselves and say, is what I'm thinking harmful? Is what I'm saying harmful? Is what I'm doing harmful? And then we can make the active choice to change that. 
So harm is one of the first obstacles to yoga. Harm is one of the first. Because as you're all learning in your yoga teacher training program, yoga is not standing on your head. That's a technique, you know. Warrior posture is a technique. Pranayama is a technique. Even meditation is a technique. A technique associated with yoga. But what is yoga? Yoga is the experience of inner peace and balance and being a peaceful force walking through the world, being a peaceful essence walking through the world. And we know we're at peace because we're not harmed or harmful. The mind is not disturbed by actions, thoughts, intentions of ourselves or of any other being. So when we really start stepping on this path, and especially when we're going to come into the role of being a teacher, this is something that we need to consider, significantly consider. In what ways in my life can I adopt more compassionate behavior, a kinder way of thinking, a more unified approach to living? In what ways can I modify my life, my being, so that I might experience the yoga, the unity, the peace. And then the beautiful thing about Patanjali is that he laid out these 10 precepts, you know, and you can look at them and you can say, well, today I'm going to practice satya. Today I'm going to practice truthfulness. Today I'm really going to get up a rigraha down. I'm going to get the non-grasping down to a really good place. Or today, I feel very close to Ishwar Pranidhana. I feel very close to God consciousness. And that's fine. But never lose sight of the fact that if you become skillful or masterful at Ahimsa, the rest follow. The rest fall right into place. Because when you become a master of not harming, you are truthful. You are not grasping. You are compassionately disciplined. You are God conscious. So Ahimsa comes first for a very important reason. And so that would be, at least from my perspective, the number one obstacle that we face as yoga practitioners and as yoga teachers. And so when we invoke Ganesh at the very beginning, of our class or of our session or of our day, what we're, what one of the things we're asking is, allow me to resolve this obstacle of harmfulness. Allow me to resolve that tendency so that I can be the good person that I know I am, the good yoga teacher I know I am, the good friend I know I am. So this is just one example of how you can interpret the teachings of yoga and the sacred writings of India and apply them to your life, not just your yoga practice on the mat, but your sadhana or your spiritual practice off the mat as well. And again, when we come to ahimsa, this concept of not harming, it is potentially the most important. So let's go to the second page, which is a mantra, which you have probably all heard before. This mantra um, I have learned in, in my own personal studies is most closely associated with Swami Nirmalananda, um, who had an ashram in southern India. He was lovingly known as the silent yogi or the silent master, the silent guru, because he took a vow of silence for 10 or 12 years. And he felt that until we have this concept of ahimsa mastered, our suffering will not stop. And therefore, in his perspective, and in many of his students and followers' perspective, this statement Loka, samasta, sukhino, bhavantu, 
is the most important statement that we can make. It's the most important intention that we can set. It has a place in every single yoga class and in every single day and in every single moment. Loka samasta suki no bhavantu. May all beings be happy and free from suffering. And then in the Jiva Mukti lineage, which was founded by Sharon Gannon and David Life, they, they extrapolated that definition out a little bit. And they said, and may my thoughts, my words, and my actions have something to do with that. So right there, you have very skillful teachers who are saying, first, set the intention to see that all beings are freed from suffering, and second, do something about it. Be the change you wish to see in the world, which is one of Gandhi's famous quotes. Be the change you wish to see in the world. So here, loka samasta suki no bhavantu, the practice of yoga, including meditation, pranayama, and asana, give us the opportunity to experience what it is like to be the other. So you take tree pose on your mat. Most of us, when we take tree pose, we might think to ourselves, wow, I've really got great balance. Or, wow, I really don't have great balance. We forget that we're assuming the tree pose. We're not to be concerned with how our balance is more than we are to be concerned about what the tree goes through being the tree. We take downward facing dog pose. We're being the dog. You know, we're, we're learning what it's like for the dog to alleviate its own tension. We take snake posture, you know, cobra, or locust posture, or, or any of the postures that are named and, and modeled after um, an entity of some sort. What we're actually doing is placing ourselves in the shoes, or the roots, of that being and saying, what is it like to be a tree? What do I have in commonality with that? What can I learn from that? Well, here are some things you can learn from the tree. You can learn how to be strong, but flexible. You can learn how to be tall, but grounded. You can learn how to be not attached. You can learn how to be a support. How to have no expectation. This time of the year is so beautiful, it's fall, you know? And the leaves, they've, they've just passed their peak now, but were they not beautiful this year? They were so stunning. And you see that they start to fall off of the tree. And they don't say, put me back. <laughs> they just follow whatever journey it is that they're meant to be on. That's where they go. We can learn from that. Because how many ways in how many times and how many days do we say, put me back? somewhere to a prior condition, to a prior happiness, to a prior memory. The tree, its branches, its twigs, and its leaves teach us how to be here now, in this moment, seeing and accepting what is. For your students in your yoga classes, and hopefully you'll all be teaching so many yoga classes, for your students, one of the most important things that you can teach them is how to be not harmful to themselves and how to be present. And so now you've got three great tools to do that. Conversation of Ahimsa, Loka Samasta Suki No Bhavantu, and Tree Pose. So it goes beyond just teaching a technique. And it moves into what starts off as esoteric wisdom, but what actually ends up as a very practical application. And one of the things that I find so amazing about yoga is that this is what they were thinking like 5,000 years ago, you know? Like 5,000 years ago, there were teachers who saw what the dilemma was of every human and who actually spent time contemplating on that. When we talk about the classical yogis, Patanjali and his crew, you know, they were classical yogis. They were very austere practitioners. So they did things like 
hang upside down from a tree branch for a couple of months. <coughs> Eat a grain of rice a day for a year. Abstain from drinking water. And we look at that and, and yeah, we do giggle, right? Because it's like, that's pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. And some people might even say, that's a little crazy. But think about what they were doing. What they were doing was they were getting down to the root of suffering. They were investigating what causes suffering, how we react and respond to it, and how we can alleviate it. They did all this amazing homework for us. So now all we have to do is get onto our yoga mat and recreate it in a way that makes sense to us today without hanging upside down from the tree for three months or eating a grain of rice a day for a year or abstaining from water. So we really, as yogis and as yoga teachers, we really owe them a debt of gratitude. And this is why it's so very important for us to always go to the root. To go to the root, the point of origin. Where does yoga come from? It is not a modern phenomenon. It is 5,000, 10,000, older even. We don't even know how very old it is. If I came to you and I said, and you needed, uh, let's just say brain surgery, and I came to you and I said, well, I could do your brain surgery. I just learned all about the brain yesterday. Or if I came to you and I said, I have been studying a science that will allow me to do this for you based on wisdom that is thousands of years old. Which me would you prefer? Yeah. So acknowledging the root, acknowledging where this science and spirituality comes from instills in the student a level of confidence <coughs> that you are following a path that is tried and true and not something that was just made up yesterday. And lineages in the world today, no matter what they're called, all come from that same root. They may be presented in slightly different ways, but they all come from that same root. And so that's the next thing that, you know, studying the sacred writings of India has to offer us as yoga practitioners and as yoga teachers is a foundation, is a root, a place from which whatever it is that we're teaching comes from, whether it's the tree pose or the locust pose or the meditation or the pranayama. So all these things come from that place. So we are then and there giving our students a reason to feel confident about the teachings. But the other thing that I usually find very interesting is that they did do this five, 10,000 years ago and we're still practicing. <laughs> so we haven't quite got it yet, you know? We, we're still interpreting, we're still finding our way through. Soon, <laughs> very soon. So I've given you a list on page five of the classic popular texts, um, the sacred texts that you'll most oftentimes hear about in classes that teach the spirituality or that you yourself might want to refer to. And so just briefly going down, we have the Vedas, which are called Shruti because they are heard, they are received, they were not written down you know, or created by people, they're divine. Um, divinely inspired and um, they were received by the rishis so the rishis wrote them and the word Veda means knowledge and there are four books to the Vedas the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajur Veda and the Atarva Veda they deal with mantra, melody for the mantra rituals and sacrifice and folk medicine and there's a beautiful story contained in the Vedas called the Nasadiya Sukta, the not the non-existent, or the story of the origin of the universe. And we're going to explore that in just a moment or two. There are also associated books. So it's kind of like you've got your Britannica encyclopedia, and then you have your, you know, or, well, actually, let's do it this way. You've got your... Um, uh, Wuthering Heights, and then you've got your cliff notes, right? <laughs> yeah. So now you've got the Vedas, which are the primary, and then you've got these associated books called uh, the Brahmana, which are commentaries, 
the Aranyakas, which uh, focus on rituals, and the Upanishads, which focus on spiritual understanding using stories and terms that are easily understandable for the most part to the reader, um, wherein the Vedas can be a little bit confusing or challenging to understand, a lot of abstract um, uh, descriptions in there. In the Upanishads, which date back potentially as far as 800 BCE, Upanishad um, means or translates to sit near. So the Upanishads were often taught by teachers who traveled across the landscape. And they would gather, kind of like we're gathered here today, probably sitting under a tree somewhere on a nice day. And the teacher would share with them a story. And then each individual would take from the story what they took. You know, There would definitely be a lesson there to be learned how to be a good person, how to live a good life, how to be a member of a community, how to uplift others, how to experience consciousness, how to self-awaken. And then usually back then, you know, you're very fortunate, right? Because you come here twice a week, I think, to gather with Christopher and Carrie. And then you go about your daily, you know, business, you go to work or your schedules, whatever that entails. And probably back in the day, it might have been a little different because the teachers back then were constantly traveling across the landscape, stopping from place to place to place. So, so maybe you got to see your teacher a couple of times a year. So today we're very blessed because we get to gather with our teachers more consistently. And we get to, to dive in a little more deeply. Yeah. Um, it's referred to as the Vedanta, which means that it's the end of the Veda. So the Vedas and then the Upanishads were, were written closer toward the end of that series of books. And so it's called Vedanta. Uh, there are over 200, some say 252, that have been written, of which 108 are um, considered early or traditional texts. And then there are 14 primary texts, and I've listed those out for you. So now just there, in, in those two, in the Vedas and the Upanishads, you have class themes for the rest of your teaching experience. If you need a theme for your class, an inspiration, an intention, uh, Eknath Eshwaran wrote a wonderful book called The Upanishads. And it's his commentary or his reflection on those writings. Purchase the book, open up to any page, and anything you read on that page, you will be able to theme an entire class and even a workshop or a series out of. Because everything that is written in the Upanishads is amazingly powerful. The lessons about life and death, the meaning of life, consciousness and unison with the divine, the meaning of Om, the primordial sound of the universe. All of these conversations are included in the Upanishads. And therefore, they are a very rich resource for you. And in a little while, we'll be going over um, a story or two from there and talking about how you can incorporate that into a class or a workshop. Then we have the Bhagavad Gita. How many of you have read the Bhagavad Gita? Very good. And I do understand that you'll be diving into that a little bit later in the training. Yeah. The Bhagavad Gita is potentially the primary scripture in yoga. It is a conversation between Krishna, who is the Godhead, and Arjuna, who is many things. His cousin, his friend, his student. And this conversation, which has been taken out of a larger book called the Mahabharata, this conversation, which is 18 chapters long, potentially answers every question you could ever ask in this life about your purpose, the cause and resolution of suffering, and the path to enlightenment. So 18 chapters, 100-ish pages, and the entire book is this conversation about karma, which is action, jnana, which is knowledge, and bhakti, which is devotion. So action, knowledge, and devotion. And these three words 
Are primary words on your spiritual path? Are the actions that I'm taking not harming? Intentional. Well thought out. Or at least not intentionally harming. Are they devotional? Do I see taking a walk through nature to be as sacred as brushing my teeth? Or do I see brushing my teeth as a mundane act and walking through nature as the, the sweetness of the divine? Am I able to bring the action of thinking to a place of equanimity? In order to do so, we need knowledge, jnana, knowledge. And that knowledge comes from right thinking, right seeing, and right acting. So these things, they constantly interweave with one another. So how do we go from seeing brushing our teeth as just a mundane thing that we do in the morning to actually being a sacred act? Well, it starts with acquiring a non-harmful <coughs> perspective of yourself, that you are an amazing miracle of life that you are a unique representation of the essence of whatever you would like to call that universal divinity. You're not here because you're some kind of biological, you know, evolutionary mistake. You know, you're here for purpose. And that includes brushing your teeth. If you're here for divine purpose, and most of you come into a yoga training because you recognize that on some, some level, you're saying to yourself, there's something I wanna do in this life, there's something special, I wanna to touch people, I wanna heal myself, something. So you recognize that. Then that means that there's no moment in your life that is not important. There's no moment in your life that is not sacred. There's no moment in your life that is any less than laying on the soft grass under the night sky and becoming absorbed in the beauty of the universe with equanimity. So you work, you do your studies, you acquire the knowledge necessary to support the action and you allow it to be a devotion. Devotion to what? To whatever your tradition is. So whether it's, you know, Christ or Allah or Shiva or Krishna or Mary or Devi, whatever your devotion is to, you allow your life to become that. Not just your Sunday or your Monday or your Friday, but your every day, your every moment. Even the brushing of your teeth. When we start talking to students like that, which sounds on one side very esoteric, right? But on the other side, it's actually really practical. Because until you see yourself, until each person sees themselves as worthy of healing, how will they ever heal? And if you see any moment in your life as being less worthy than another moment, then you're not seeing yourself as a whole, holistic being, as worthy of healing. And what you're telling your students every time you teach a class is, you're worthy of healing. So now you have to share with them, or you could share with them, how they can begin to understand and act upon that information in a way that sees it through to its fruition of healing. Does that make sense? No? So the Bhagavad Gita, and we'll talk about a couple of chapters there. Patanjali Sutras, we will visit a few. We've already talked a little bit about the Yama and Niyama, but we will also come back to that again. Then, um, time permitting, uh, we're covering so much today. We'll do a discussion on the, the Ramayana, the march of Ram, or the life of Rama. And this beautiful sacred text is all about ethic, you know? Sometimes in this modern time, we hear the word ethic and we think, you want to take something away from me. You know, you hear the word ethic and, and, and some people might think, you want to put restraints upon me. 
But here's the, the interesting thing. When we act without ethic, we are literally caging ourselves into a behavior that is harmful on some level and restricting our ability to love and to accept others as they are. When we act with ethic, we expand our own consciousness to see, to accept, and to appreciate with deep gratitude the fact that this life, this existence, is so very expansive. And every person and every being is so very resilient in the way that they walk their path in the way that they make their choices, good or bad, in the way that they recover. To act ethically by not harming, not lying, not grasping, having a pure mind, letting go of expectations, being devotional, it opens up our inner spaciousness and it opens up spaciousness for other people to be who they are without the fear of our demands that they be a certain way. And that right there alleviates suffering. Loka, samasta, suki no bhavantu. How rigid would your life feel if all you ever did was walk around saying, I've got to live up to expectations? Oh wait, we do that, don't we? <laughs> We do, all the time. We say, what is mom gonna say? What is dad gonna say? What is my yoga teacher gonna say? What are all these people gonna say? Because on some level, people put expectations upon other people and then we allow that. That's not ethic. Ethic is not force. Ethic is empowerment. The empowerment of another being to live to their potential through freedom and the absence of fear of your own expectations of them. So when you're in your yoga class and your student comes up to you and says, am I doing this right? Or more importantly, when they come up to you and say, am I doing this wrong? Your answer is, you're doing it. That's what matters. You're doing it. You're on your path. You're having an experience. Are there things that are not functioning optimally that can function a little smoother? Yes. Are there things that are functioning really, really well? Yes. And that's the condition of being human. So you dot your I's and cross your T's. You read them a quote out of the Bhagavad Gita that's inspiring. It is better to fail at your own work miserably than to succeed at the work of another. Right? Or some other quote out of the Bhagavad Gita. There's 18 chapters worth. You see what I mean? We could stop there, you know, and that's like enough for the rest of our teaching careers all put together, you know, but we'll keep going. So in the Ramayana, you know, we can talk about how Hanuman, how Hanuman faced, you know, demon after demon after demon who tried to stop him from fulfilling his purpose, his sacred purpose, his divine purpose of being of service to Ram. Time and time and time again, through criticism, through expectation, through um, incorrect information, all of these influences tried to sway his love, his devotion. And time and time and time again, he said, I won't be swayed. Your expectations are not my problem. My love for Ram supersedes all. And we'll get to the bottom of that shortly. And then we come to the Devi Mahatmya. So I consider myself a Shakta. A Shakta is a person who um, sees the divine feminine as the foundation. 
What is the divine feminine? A woman? No, it's an energy. There are two potentialities in the universe. There is stillness and there's movement. There's logic and there's creativity or imagination. There is strength or hardness and there's softness. There's um, obvious and mystery. The masculine is most oftentimes associated with that which is stable, still, logical, hard, strong, and obvious. The feminine is associated with the opposite, the creativity, the mystery, the movement. A shakta is a person who feels that that, that is the foundation of the structure of the universe, the divine feminine. The divine masculine absolutely is there too. So how do we know the divine masculine is there too? You know, because really they're both just kind of like level with each other, right? We have Shiva and we have Shakti. Shiva is the representation of the divine masculine. Shakti is the representation of the divine feminine. He sits in meditation. He's known as the great meditator. And Shiva in, in a, a, the human form will meditate for thousands of years. Until Shakti says, let's go. <laughs> and she causes him to move somehow. And then they engage in a dance, a dance that manifests the reality that we live in, or the non-reality, depending upon what words you want to use. The lila, the play, back and forth. So you have the divine masculine and the divine feminine. And a shakta is a person who generally sees the importance of the divine feminine. Now today's world that we live in is very much hyper-focused on the masculine. And not so much for its benefit. Look, if you don't have any strength, you're weak, correct? If you don't have any logic, then how do you do problem solving, you know? Even the most creative problem solver has to have logic. So the masculine is necessary. But the masculine has, over the centuries, gotten a little out of control and completely overwhelmed the feminine. And what that has led us to, and you'll see this in your students, in your classes, is a sense of rigidity, a sense of critical self-judgment, a lack of compassion, and confusion over the importance of self-awareness. Who am I trying to satisfy here? Myself or my boss? Myself or, you know, um, to look a certain way in a yoga class, to be a certain way in a yoga class. Is my posture as good as hers or his? That would be a lot of masculinity because that's competition. So when we are studying the Devi Mahatmya, what we're saying is we need to expand. We got to come out of this contraction. We have to expand. And, and yes, there is a place for strength, but there's a place for softness. There's a place for, for logic, but there's a place for creativity. There's a place for all of it. And this is why, on some level, we see this beautiful rendition or this beautiful um, representation of Shiva and Shakti in what's called the Ardha Narishwara, which is the intertwined male and female, or the being who is half masculine, half feminine. Because this gentleman here is not just masculine, and I'm not just feminine. I have masculine, and he has feminine. Both exist in all of us all the time. The question is, are they balanced? 
The Devi Mahatmya gives us a path to balance. It provides us with a way of seeing and experiencing the world that heightens our understanding and invites a deeper level of knowledge and an ability to recognize that when something is out of balance, it is always, without exception, under our control to bring it back. Always and without exception. We have that ability, even when we feel hopeless, even when we feel we don't. And so these scriptures, which I've, I've spent the first portion of our time introducing, we're going to dive into. For the next two hours, we're going to come into a deeper study of some parts of these scriptures. We're going to take a little bit of a break. Um, but it, before we do that, does anybody have any questions or comments that they would like to share? Is it resonating? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is it easy? No. It's not easy. It's not easy. Do you look forward to the journey? Yes. With great curiosity. Excitement. Excitement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And apprehension. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. A very healthy balance there. You know, it's a very healthy balance. To look and to say, you know what, I don't know it all. I only know a little. I know enough to get me started, and I know enough to support you starting. But the rest of it is as vast as that night sky is. So let's take a break, and we'll come back in um, 10 minutes. And in that time, um, be silent. In these 10 minutes, be silent. Do what you need to do. Get your tea, use the restroom, whatever it happens to be. And in that silent time, if there was one or two things that we just discussed that resonated with you, sit with that, contemplate it, and see where it belongs in you. Good? Okay, 10 minutes. Thank you. 